when you look at the main drivers that are there, um, I, I, you know, there, there's lots of different areas, lots of different reasons why uh, various different organizations, depending on the size of the organization as well, are looking at cloud. Some are looking to reduce their carbon footprint um, by moving it off of their premises into somebody else's, um, kind of offsetting that. Um, others are looking for the cost saves um, related to the fact that you just pay as you go um, or pay by use. Um, and then uh, others, again, are just looking for that edge, that performance edge, uh, giving their customers the best end user experience by being as close as possible to those end users. Um, so there's multiple different drivers out there, you know, getting people to to move to this, and, you know, uh, there's also the operational efficiency. Uh, you don't have to support the underlying hardware. Uh, so there's multiple reasons why um, organizations want to move to uh, public cloud environments um, or even any kind of cloud environment or edge environment, uh, moving it off of their premises, um, getting rid of that uh, year six hardware refresh. Um, you know, or, or if you've got, uh, underlying hardware that is kind of coming to the end of its life cycle, you know, might be a time to look at retiring it rather than refreshing it. Uh, yep, we, we've had a few answers. I mean, most people are talking about moving um, application and services closer to end users for better user experience. Yeah. And also, I'll, I'll, so, <laughs> yeah, and also, and also um, operational efficiency from not needing to support the underlying hardware, be able to focus presumably on um, serving the customer better. There seems yeah, to be no, a uh, predominant feeling. Excellent. So the, the, those are kind of the, the top ones, top of mind as well for IBM. Uh, I think the, um, uh, the you know, not supporting the underlying hardware makes a lot of sense. You know, historically, you know, a lot of hardware has stayed in use because um, critical applications have been put on it. And then, you know, it, it, it's a case of kind of retraining new hires into old technology to try and support existing critical infrastructure, or critical applications that are running on critical infrastructure. Um, but from a point of view of getting closer to your end user and making sure that they've got... Um, you know, a better end user experience. Um, did, did you, we got a couple of stats here to back up the importance of giving that better end user experience um, that just one tenth of a second improvement in website or website or application speed is, is, is equivalent to 10% higher sales. That's only 1.1 1 .1 of a second. That's a, it's a massive difference there. 53% um, of customers will leave your site. It takes more than three seconds to load. You know, half. That's uh, that's worrying. And, you know, um, so in each time a video stream rebuffers is equal to 1% abandonment rate. So th these are um, quite startling statistics about how your application performance in those areas, in that your edge or multi-cloud or uh, hybrid cloud environment um, is is going to be critical to uh, bring to your rent revenue uh, to your bottom line, uh, and that's um, that's a kind of a these are really these are key um, to wanting to make sure you know what what can you do about it when you know <clears throat> we got IBM hybrid cloud mesh is IBM's kind of solution in this area. Um, and you might be asking IBM in networking, hasn't happened in in a long, long time. I, you know, I suppose in the 20 years that I've been working in network engineering, IBM haven't been a player. Um, you know, before I started, Token Ring was a, was, was a big thing, um, and that was IBM's, uh, and it worked. Um, but we're, we're back in the game now, but it's very much from that application side of things. I suppose uh, IBM and I, with, with, uh, has always had that area of strength in applications, application platforms, um, helping our customers in that area. And the reason for IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh is that we've had customers coming to us saying, 
IBM help us. We, we're, we're trying to run your applications in, in um, hybrid cloud, in public cloud, in edge. You know, the connectivity part is, is, is very, very difficult. You know, things have changed a lot. And um, so we, we started looking at it and, you know, there was a couple of statistics that came to mind again. I, I know I'm heavy on statistics at the start. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into technology here in a short bit. But um, one of the things that I came across was back in 2015, Forbes magazine had a, an article out uh, where they predicted that 98 percent of all data center traffic was going to come from the cloud. 98 percent that's that's a huge that's a huge um huge amount of traffic that was going to be coming from public cloud environments um but in 2022 the idc had a survey out of uh leading uh technology firms where 73 percent of respondents on that one said that they were actively looking at um pulling all or some of their uh, cloud deployments, cloud workloads back to private IP environments. So I, I looked at this and I thought, well, that's that's an amazing journey right there from 2015 to 2022. That, those seven years where, you know, theoretically, they were meant to have nearly all of workloads in the cloud. And instead, two years beyond that date, there you're looking at you know three quarters of respondents are saying that they're going to pull back from public cloud environments and you know we started asking the question of why why would um why would you not move to public cloud or what what is it that is uh making companies pull back from those public cloud environments um what's blocking it um so we, we categorize these into kind of three main buckets um, as to blockers for uh, enterprises and uh, companies and organizations from moving their workloads to the cloud. And they're pretty much pretty, you know, um, self explanatory. We got we, technical reasons for it. It's highly complex. Um, so, as much as everyone tried to paint the picture of cloud as being a simpler, way to run your organization run your workloads it's highly complex it's a completely different way of doing everything because you no longer have access to your you know physical layer your data link layer your networking layer your tr first three layers of the osi model it's it's somebody else's network and you don't have visibility into that you don't have access to it you can't make changes on it in fact, all you get is kind of virtual constructs that help you manage your workloads in their environment, but you can't really impact any change there or you know configure it for your own particular needs. And basically, whatever way it's configured underneath is the way it is for you, no matter what way that that's fixed. Um, Poor observability again. You know, you you don't have access to those you know data link layers of your um your your um your networking layers so mac addresses don't exist your ability to view the network layer and understand latencies properly and understand where bottlenecks are how you know for the most part public cloud environments don't even have any kind of qos you can't tag traffic you can't prioritize traffic they don't support it um with the mac addresses not being there um, you're going to have, you know, it's very difficult to implement any kind of HA. Um, high availability is generally, you know, floating stat, floating MAC addresses that go between two endpoints. One of them is not there. It the, the working one takes over the, that virtual MAC address. But in a public cloud environment, you don't have that. You have to do it in a different way. You generally have to put a proxy there in front of it or something to kind of let low balance across it. Um, got reduced control. It's not your environment, and an increased security risk. You you drop in the first of the uh, of of your uh, security pillars uh, of your IT security pillars, your physical security. As soon as you take it out of your data center, it's not it's no longer you know with, with, under your control. And then there's the human barriers, and this one really spoke to me um, because when I was in my previous role, I did have to have a number of very difficult conversations with. Uh, professionals with many years of experience it's just 
we were changing to public cloud environments and you know uh, telling them that you know we i still want them to be you know my my sme for connectivity but i needed them to retrain to learn new to uh develop their coding skills you know everything had to be managed in terraform so they had to go away and learn terraform but not only that they also had to go away and um become an expert in uh, in aws um and that wasn't an easy journey either you know they had to do their cloud practitioner they had to do their um solutions architect role um and that, that's the you know the, the, there's a, a basic version of that and then there's the professional version of it um and then once they've got those three things behind them then they can specialize in um advanced networking but to get to the advanced networking the, the aws also recommends that you have five years experience of building complex networks and clouds so that's you know a bit of a catch-22 there um how do you manage to do that how do you square that peg um there's um you know it, it all of their aspects to it when you're asking them to do the same job just without any of the tools that they're used to without any of the controls that they're used to um you're kind of asking them to do their job with one hand tied behind their back and a blindfold on it's going to drive a lot of frustration and insecurity and at a time when it's very difficult to find um network engineers in the first place there's a shortage of you know professionals out there you know when you start driving towards cloud environments you know you're going to create an insecurity there and you you could possibly lose some very talented uh people where they feel like their skill set doesn't quite align to where um the organization is going then we have the financial barriers and i, I think this one is kind of it's the biggest shock of all for most enterprises when they start moving to public cloud because everybody is going to public cloud on the promise of saving money you have to save money don't you because it's you're paying by use um so you know if you don't use it you're not paying for it and that great um you don't have any capacity constraints you've next to endless capacity so you know i mean you don't have to go and pay for very costly very large pipes that you only use um infrequently um but the big problem there is that you any time you move a workload to a cloud environment, well, I think what we've discovered over the last number of years is that IBM has actually been quite on the money when it comes to their prediction that hybrid cloud is where it's at. That they always felt that um, not every app, they always felt that every application is different and unique, and it's true. Um, IBM are the you know world leaders in understanding applications and um so when they feel that you know every application is unique and they all have their own kind of needs and requirements as an application and clearly some applications are not going to do well in cloud environments and some applications just need to stay on prem um, and they don't lend themselves to easy modernization or migration. So hybrid cloud is where it's at. Um, now, when you start to be doing hybrid cloud, the real cost saves that you get from public cloud is being able to shut down a hardware data center entirely and moving all of those workloads to the cloud. At that point, you can at least make the saving on the, the lease and the heating and cooling in that, uh, in the power in that um, physical data center that you had. Once you move it to the cloud, you're going to incur all kinds of new costs as well. So before, when you were paying for, you know, the capacity on a circuit, in this new world, no longer paying for capacity on the circuit, you're paying for total volume of data transferred. Nobody's measuring total volume of data transferred. If you're looking at any application to a microservice and you're say, looking at how much data gets transferred across that, you know, across a circuit, across a WAN circuit, across a LAN, you're only ever looking at peaks and troughs, trying to understand 
do I have enough capacity? Do I need to add more capacity? Do I need to upgrade some routers or switches or firewalls to give me more throughput, more capacity? Do I need to get a larger pipe from my WAN provider because you know I'm, I'm getting to the 85th percentile on that particular circuit? I need to be able to burst higher. In the cloud, you don't have those worries or you know constraints around capacity. Instead, you're going to be paying for total volume of data transferred. So instead of paying megabits per second, you're paying for the total number of gigabits that have been transferred over the last month. That's a very, very difficult thing then to, to forecast and budget for. When you didn't have that visibility to start with, then you move an application to a cloud environment, and it's not even a one for one, depending on where you move it to, and depending on where it's sending traffic, that cost is very variable. In fact, it, you know, if you look at, you know, if you move an entire system into a single VPC, into a single availability zone, generally there's no cost for any data transferred in that environment. Now, you know, so it's, you know, same, same region, same VPC, same AZ, no cost. You go across AZs, you want to add some uh, high availability to it and say, you want to put part of it, even you know, same same VPC, but across two availability zones. Now you're going to be paying one cent for total for, per gigabit of data transferred. That's not so bad, one one cent. But then when you start, you know, expanding that out and say, well, actually, you know, some of this, you know, application maybe it needs to go back to a data cent, uh, a, 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 a database that's still on prem. Now you're starting to look at that, going, okay. So now it's a database on-prem. Now it needs to go from a VPC back to an on-prem uh, database. Depending on if you have a private circuit, maybe you've got a, an express route or maybe you've got a, a private direct connect there. Well, that's going to cost you in around you know 16 cent per gigabit of data transferred. That's a big step up. That's 16 times the price. That's... That's expensive now. Now you're you're looking at some, you know, that's a big leap from one cent to sixteen cent, sixteen times the price. Um, and then it gets worse because if you don't have that private circuit in place, if you're not paying for that private circuit and the expense of that, and, and you're you're sending that traffic back over the internet, maybe across a VPN, that's going to be nineteen cent per gigabit of data transferred in a month. That's a big big leap. So when you start moving applications and workloads to public cloud environments, understanding exactly how much data it transfers and where it's sending that data to, where that egress is going to, and then you got you know it, it, I think uh, is it G Google charge for ingress and egress. So if it's going into that cloud or out of that cloud, they're going to charge you for it. And you know so understanding where those charges are coming from, how those charges are reached. It's very, very difficult to, to do. So budgeting for that is extremely difficult because you might go along and say, I'm going to move one workload this week or this month, and next month I'm going to move a different one. And the, ch the charges associated with both moves, you know, it, it, if the first one is going to cost you, say, $150 per month for the first month that it was there, you might think that oh i'll move another one and that that will change my my cost to three hundred dollars per month but it might not be then we might move the second one it could be a very chatty application that's sending a lot of traffic back on prem and now and now all of a sudden it, instead of being 150 dollars for a monthly bill you're getting three thousand dollars for a monthly bill and you're going oh hang on a second how do we jump from that to there um so understanding that from a, a budgeting and forecasting uh is, is that's a very, very difficult place to be. Um, so I'd like to, um, to, to to pause right here and just we, we run our second poll, Stephen, if you will, um, to find out from the audience um, exactly which one of these barriers, the technical, the human and the financial kind of speaks to them the most. Um, what is the biggest barrier that's preventing their cloud journeys? Um, I suppose. Uh, so we, we'll, we'll ask everybody that question um, and try and get a, an understanding of it. Uh, I, I think from my frame of mind, we've all been talking about cloud journeys for, you know, 
five or 10 years now. It's been a long time that we've been talking about these cloud journeys and everybody's still on it. You know, whether you describe yourself as being, you know, cloud first now or cloud only, everybody's got a strategy around cloud. But, you, you know, after, you know, three, five, seven years, you must be asking the question, why is it going so slow? That's a lifetime in IT. You know, think about all of the, the, the technological breakthroughs that we've had in that time. And, you know, even in a year, how many technological breakthroughs have happened, especially when you, know, you look at, you know, the here and now with AI and what's and X, et cetera. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, all of these mad breakthroughs in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and you start wondering, well, we're still talking about cloud journeys. We're still talking about moving these workloads to cloud environments. What is it that's stopping us from getting that job done, from taking advantage of that? You know, it's clear as day from that, you know, first slide of those statistics, you know, you know, just a tenth of a second of improvement in speed. It's 10% higher sales. There's good reasons to move there, but you know, there's obviously some problems with it. Um, so the poll has been up. Um, unfortunately, you know, the trainers are not able to see that. But just to let okay. you know, um, yeah. most of the our responses um, is technical. It's too complex. Legacy applications that can't easily be modernized. So that's, yeah. you know, most of the answers are that one. Very good. And, you know, um, that, that's, that's great. So it's mostly in that technical area. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's good news. We, we'll, we'll get to how hybrid cloud mesh can simplify um, all of that for you in, in just a moment here. But I think those three main barriers that we have with technical, especially technical, um, these are really compounded by the fact that everybody's yeah. environment at the moment is network centric. Um, when we talk about network centric, it's everything is based around the network. And I suppose this kind of speaks to me as well, because I, I kind of grew up with the idea that everything revolves around the network. In fact, there was um, an old mentor of mine used to describe networking as networking is like oxygen. Uh, once it's gone, you're gone. Um, so networking is very, very critical to most, in, most businesses, most uh, organizations. So to describe an organization as being network centric, that's that's pretty much everybody. Everyone needs to have that robust network. But the problem with starting first with a network, which is the way it always was, you go into a new site, first thing you do is you build out a network. You put it, you you build it, and then you add your applications and services and people afterwards. But it's all about the network. But the network and the applications are then completely independent. And you can only put an application where the network is already. And anytime that you want to move it around, it's not like you can just up and shift a, a firewall to suit. Um, you kind of have to just build and rebuild and make those big changes. But the problem with making changes on big things like you know, the underlying network itself, that's going to cause lots of impacts on every other service that's using that network. So the network is, you know, that that those problems of those technical problems with trying to achieve that cloud migration, they're really compounded by that network centric approach. Your network exists on your uh, physical private IP environment. Um, it's very rigid um, and very reactive. And then as soon as you move your applications out of it, they're insecure. But we, we believe that the business value here is in to driving towards an application-centric solution, an application-centric overlay solution to be more specific, um, where the network is actually going to follow the applications wherever they go. So when we talk about application centricity, we don't just mean that we, we I feel that, that the network needs to know about the application. It not, doesn't need to just know about the application. It needs to, you need to start with the application in the center of everything you do. We've already called it out. Just one-tenth of a second improvement in speed is 
of an improvement in sales, then that application is core to your business value. It's core to your profitable revenue. Now, if that if your application is the thing that is core to what you do, then you want to be there to support that. That is the core part of your business. You put that in the center of everything you do and you wrap everything else around that. That's application centricity. Everything, everything goes around the application. The application becomes central to everything you do. The network just follows the application wherever it goes. And we'll talk about that later. I've got a really cool demo to show you guys on that. Um, where we can um, now, now by driving towards application centricity, you're a lot more agile. And in the world of, of cloud environments where applications can, the underlying hardware can be shut down or pulled out or changed at any moment in time, applications can move from one location to another physical device. It'll look like the same to you, but you know, IP addresses can change, locations can change, physical hard, underlying hardware can change. But the, the network needs to follow that wherever it goes. You need to be a lot more agile. And then all of the associated security policies with every application also need to go with it. So you, you don't want a situation where somebody moves an application, all of a sudden you have to redo all of your policies associated with that. You have to change all of those or maybe try and translate from on-prem to public cloud. It's very difficult to do. You need to have those proactive optimizations in place. Um, so it, that's, you know, these are all of the things that are kind of holding us back from achieving in those cloud environments in this new modern age of where everything is so hyper distributed. Um, so we started off uh, very much along the lines of what all of our most of our respondents were saying to those barriers that were stopping us from getting to the cloud in the first place, the complexity. So the first thing we, we in IBM when we were looking at IBM Hyper Cloud Mesh, we wanted to develop something that was number one simple because what you're looking at um, when you try and move any workload to a public cloud environment, the amount of browser tabs that you need to have open, the amount of you know integrating with the CLI um, and the the console for those cloud environments. You know, any changes that you're making, you need to have 20 screens, never mind 20 browser tabs. You're, you have tabs and browsers everywhere, and you're trying to translate across all of them. And especially when you start thinking about the fact that you've got so many different networks, your private network, your public cloud environment, maybe your second public cloud environment, your, your edge environment, all of these separate networks that are there and separate ways to support each of them to, you know, when one of the big things that we were talking about at the start as well of, is that operational simplicity, not having to support the underlying hardware. Well, that's one thing, not, not having to support the underlying hardware, but when you move to public cloud environments and everybody does it differently, well, that's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's compounding that complexity where you've got completely different ways of doing things. And you know, to add to that complexity, I like to, you know, um, every one of those public cloud environments, they all have very similar terms. You know, you got express routes, private connects, uh, transit gateways, virtual routers, uh, virtual machines, instances. Things kind of sound similar, but when you actually dig into how they all operate, they all do things very differently. So I, I like to think that, you know, um, you know, AWS works in one, two, three, and Azure works in ABC, but Google kind of works in colors and feelings. They don't necessarily tra translate very well across each other. So if you're trying to manage workloads in different cloud environments, you have to do things, you know, you have to do it, it, it with their rules and their understanding, their interpretations of it. So the first core principle that we had for uh, IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh is we like to call these the four S's of Hybrid Cloud Mesh. First one is simple. It has to be a very simple way of doing things. A SaaS based application 
centric connectivity solution. It has to be SaaS based because if you're trying to um, achieve your cloud migration, then running hardware on prem to try and uh, support software that's going to get you to that point, well, that, that doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. So a SaaS based solution for this makes a lot of sense. And operational simplicity, bridging the bridging the gaps between your, your operational teams, your DevOps teams, your application teams, and your cloud ops teams, your infrastructure teams who generally work in you know in big silos. Giving them that common platform, that that's that's a huge thing. So secured, it needs to be you know, security goes is just paramount in public cloud environments. Inherently, public cloud environments were originally created as just for web services. So if you're, you know, moving anything to a public cloud environment, they're not looking at putting security in place, number one. They're looking to make sure that your uh, web services is, is as open and available as possible. You start with that inherently open scenario then you need to have security driven into the product. We talk about zero trust in the architecture and you know, out of the box, IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh has that zero trust architecture built into it. Um, now, when we talk about, when most people hear zero trust architecture, most people are thinking about their users connecting back to their network and making sure that their users are constantly authenticated and it all happens in the background and it's nice and seamless and but to make sure that your users are your users um but when we start talking about zero trust architecture and especially when you talk about application modernization and uh, microservices based architectures and you have distributed you know parts to your net application system how do you know then that you know one microservice is belonging to you that it hasn't been compromised that it's you know we, we feel that that zero trust needs to be pushed into the application itself to make sure that that security is not just outside of that application system not just a you know to to stop things getting into your network, but it has to be across all of your network internally as well, especially when you start talking about public cloud, because now the inside of your network is already exposed. So you need to improve that security with segmentation and micro segmentation. But also when we get into the architecture here in a bit of how IBM hybrid cloud mesh actually works, you'll see that we're pushing out these edge gateways right out to those applications at the edge of your network. They control that security. That's where all of your connectivity policies are there. All of the, those, they are all feeding back the information to, um, to, that, to, to that SaaS platform, giving you visibility into 100% of the ingress and egress connections that are happening in that application system giving you an ability to see then suspicious traffic at the end point, not in a centralized firewall in the middle of your network. So many organizations out there, you've got these very large, very powerful firewalls and their only real job is to ingest all that traffic. So all of this traffic gets sent back to one of these centralized firewalls so that you can inspect that traffic, see what's suspicious, see what, you know, what, what traffic is going to a port that you don't like? See what's different, you know, how many connections are happening per second that's outside of the norm. When it happens in those centralized firewalls, you might be able to spot suspicious traffic, but trying to isolate where that's coming from, what system was infected, what needs to be shut down, what needs to be secured. It's very, very difficult there. But if you're capturing that, from right there at the end point that's sending that traffic, you see it straight away. You can see that um, that security issue, the suspicious traffic at the end point where it's coming from. And you can isolate that, shut it down, and restart it, replace it, whatever it requires to do. But that security uh, is, is massive, is scalable. Uh, it needs to be highly scalable. Um, and it's it's Please. funny, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry for interrupting. Um, we, we just had a question here. Yeah. 
Uh, which goes back to the first point, which is around it being simple. We've got somebody, um, Andrew here, that's uh, challenging on that one, saying that overlays and underlays seem quite complex. But what is the main the main benefit uh, to providing this type of application connectivity as overlay as opposed to the more sort of traditional underlay? What? Great question. Great question indeed. Um, I mean, uh, so y yes, you can you could make the argument to say that things are more simple in the underlay because that's where everybody's got their experience. Everybody's got their um, their their. Uh, technical now is in that underlay network. Um, it's you know pulling those big levers underneath. Um, in in that particular context, you'd nearly look at it and say, well, there's actually going to be two reasons, two things that I'm going to say here to drive home that simple uh, fact, uh, or maybe you know one that's going to be about simple, and then the other is you know why the overlay is so important in this case. So that underlay aspect. Um, I got kind of like to think of um, it's all about the control that you'd have. So if you start trying to make changes in your underlay to control what happens for an application connectivity solution, you know, it, I, I kind of like in making changes to the underlay is, you know, if you are having a shower that you turn off the water mains on the road instead of to turn down the water pressure in your shower, it's kind of similar. It'll work. It's just you don't really have any granular control in your shower. Instead, you want to have that tap right there next to your shower so that you can reduce your pressure right there, you know, rather than turning it off on the road instead. Um, so making any changes to your underlay network, it's a that's a big hammer. That's, you know, a big lever that you're throwing to try and impact a change uh, at that from an application point of view. Um, so, you know, the simplicity of doing this as an overlay without needing to make those changes on the underlay, extracting away all of that complexity from your net, from your application network and being able to make changes um, at that application layer where you don't need to make changes on your underlay, extracting away that complexity, lifting that above your underlay, making that as an overlay instead gives you the ability to impact changes uh, just on the overlay itself. This then also enables you to make changes on your underlay without impacting your overlay. So now you've extracted away the overlay connectivity from your underlay connectivity. You can then drive in lots of the changes that you need to make on that underlay, but simplify things on your overlay to just be about that application system that you're trying to control across the top, that you're trying to improve that performance on it. Now, the other aspect of it is, you know, any chain, any incident that might occur on your underlay network, when you start talking about how underlays fall o fail over, um, underlays generally fail over if it's a layer two it generally fails over quickly enough. So kind of we, we, we got into that fashionable point there for a while of everything had to be Metro Ethernet uh, for WAN connectivity because it was based at a layer two technology, so it would fail over faster. Um, when we start talking about, um, if you move it into layer three, then now you're starting to look at, you know, how fast OSPF fails or how fast BGP fails. And no matter what you do to reduce those timers, you know, even reducing back your hello timers to the bare minimum on BGP, you've got five seconds there, maybe. And then you've got your dead timer that needs to kick in. And then you've got, you know, all of the updates that need to get pushed out. And then you've got the network convergence on top of that. You know, you, any incident that occurs where you've got an impact on your underlying network, if you're reliant on that to, uh, drive the reliability on your application that's running on top well now you're looking at you know a minute 90 seconds possibly a couple of minutes before that stability is driven back into the application system and at the very outset of this we were talking about one you know one tenth of a second making the difference there there's no way that you can drive 
um, uh, that that level of that speed of failover into your underlay using those traditional technologies, it has to be done at layer seven. It has to be done, you know, at that namespace level where everything, you know, you know that how do you um, redirect traffic faster than a nanosecond on an underlay? You can't. On an overlay, that's very possible. We can do that, but not in an underlay. So that's, you know, there's a, a, a complexity with extracting it away to start with. But I'll show you how, how simple it can be in, in a little while when we show you um, uh, the, the first of my, my, my couple of demos here. But that first level, that, that, that extraction, that. that's, that's going to be the big one. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry for interrupting. I'm just cognizant of time here. You're obviously a very passionate guy that's got way, way too much experience. You've you've smashed that question into the ground. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave you to get back to scale. Yeah, um, so, uh, <laughs> from from a scale point of view, um, we're, we're we're looking at you know. How do you impact changes for uh, the largest of enterprise environments and be able to give organizations the ability to scale up and scale down that automatic scaling that everybody talked about when they go to, you know, cloud environments to say that, you know, that scaling down part, that's always very difficult to do. Um, we need to be able to scale up as well. But also when we talk about scalable, we want IBM HyperCloud Mesh to be not just a value to the largest of enterprise environments, but also to the smallest. Even if you have only a single workload in a single cloud, IBM HyperCloud Mesh can drive value for you too. And then seamless. And there's two aspects to seamless when we talk about this. So that we, you know, the first aspect of seamless you know, is around um, how to um, all of these uh, disparate networks that you have in AWS, in IBM Cloud, in Azure, on-prem, in your edge environment, in Equinix or wherever you are, and in your, your, your private IP environment, all of these, they're all separate networks and they're all managed in different ways. So we, we want to talk about seamless as, you know, as representing all of these diverse networks as a single seamless overlay, secure overlay network across the top. Um, reducing and removing all of those barriers that exist underneath. Um, and then the other aspect to seamless is in relation to the cloud ops teams and their DevOps teams, your operational teams that support your applications and your hardware. These teams generally work in massively isolated environments or in, in isolated ways using separate tools and separate processes and separate teams. And the status quo right now between those DevOps teams and the cloud ops teams uh, means that, you know, your application teams, they, they've gone and developed a new application that's going to be the next generation of what your, your organization needs to do. They get it ready. They deploy it to the cloud. They talk to their, they, they, they then need connectivity. So they go and talk to cloud ops and say, I need connectivity. And your cloud ops teams, they, well, generally it's the first time they'll hear about it because they're completely separate teams. But they, and they'll hear about it through ticketing or Slack or email, and that's how they communicate across these teams so we can keep track of, you know, their requests and how fast the responses are. But, you know, so you get that first request that says, I need connectivity. And then the, the, the cloud ops, the, your infrastructure teams will then have to assess what they need to do. Where is it? Uh, how do I do that? And then maybe they've got some security concerns. Maybe they pass that over to the security operations team, your SecOps teams, and ask them. Can you chip in here and see, are you worried about any of these uh, changes that need to happen? Do we need to punch holes in firewalls, et cetera? Um, how do we need to, how do we apply these changes? And then you have to put that through that all of these things through their change control systems. And that might take, you know, a week. It might take a few days. It might be, you know, maybe to be able to expedite it and do it in a matter of hours. But generally speaking, they'll get that connectivity in place. Then they'll go back to DevOps and DevOps will, you know, the application team, they'll go and test their application, find that something doesn't work. And then they're back to the cloud ops teams again with more back and forth to troubleshoot with cloud ops and DevOps and security. And you constantly have this back and forth. 
So it's taking days, weeks, if not months to actually put some, um, get some new applications running in the cloud. Um, so it's it's taking quite a long time. Now, uh, I, I think it did, uh, there's a, another poll that I wanted to put out there, Stephen, about um, asking everybody, all the audience here, how long does it generally take in their organization, in their company, how long does it take them to get a new application connected in a cloud environment? You know, it, can they get that done in a matter of hours? Can they get it done in, in you know, in a week? Is it a month? Um, how long does it take you normally to get that done? While, while that poll is going out there, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we see that working with IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh and how, you know, this drives home that simple fact. Um, so when you start talking about IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh, we got shared business objectives between the DevOps teams and the Cloud Ops teams where they can all discover, connect, secure, observe, and optimize. Everybody's using that same platform, unified solution, unified team, and unified processes. All of it taking a matter of minutes. Now, looking at that from an operational enhancement for you know weeks, if not months, down to minutes, that's a big thing. So how does it work? Um, two main component parts. We got our mesh manager, which is the SaaS portal. Uh, this is where your, your cloud ops teams and your DevOps teams, this is the common platform that they're all going to use to manage that connectivity solution. And then we have our gateways. And our you know there, there's multiple different types of gateways. Edge gateways that go out to all of your applications on the edge. Your waypoints is a new type of gateway that we're we're introducing to the world where that allows you to steer your traffic over the best possible uh, path. So you got your edge gateways that are right out there managing the connectivity for your application systems. Your waypoint is steering all the traffic around. Um, and all of this happens from an API, uh, open API, so that you can, the DevOps teams can use their, um, their DevOps tool chain to drive that connectivity. Um, now, so just want to talk briefly about the uh, use cases that we have for IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh. And I'd love to hear if uh, any of the audience has their own specific use case or if, if they're slightly inspired by any of my passion here around connectivity, around overlays and networking and are thinking, oh, I wonder, could it do this for me? Pop those into the chat, love to hear it. Um, so from an enterprise use case point of view, we got our first real use case so is just, you know, by deploying IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh, you get that application centric hybrid multi cloud secure overlay works in single cloud, multi, multi cloud, edge environment, or on prem, works across all of that, extracting away all of the, the, the complexity from all of the disparate parts of that network, representing it as a single, uh, single entity. Uh, network follows the application dynamics. This is a, 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 a unique use case, and this is, a, I think, the, the real meat and veg of the, the product here, where any time when we start talking about migrations and application systems and services that are moving from on-prem to edge or on-prem to cloud or one cloud to another cloud, well, this is where I, you know, IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh makes your life so easy because now your network is following that application wherever it goes you don't need to have all of that issues that you have around translating from physical or from physical firewall acls into security groups etc all of that gets extracted away and you get and the network just follows it wherever it goes and now you have the ability that where all of those policies just follow wherever it is Application network optimization, an ability to steer your traffic over the most optimized path, really driving home the, that, that aspect of um, an ability to steer your traffic over the best possible path. So when we start talking about application performance, this is where, you know, this is a key driver here. This is where we can deploy waypoints to steer your traffic over a faster path that's going to make that database connection that little bit quicker it's going to make that that that's the video stream 
work a little bit faster. It's going to drive it. This is where we find that nanosecond that's going to drive that 10% increase in sales. From an MSP point of view, uh, it's because IBM HyperCloud Mesh is not just for the enterprise, but also for managed service providers, you get to bundle that underlay and overlay as a single service to drive home that 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 value for your customers that your unique uh underlay with this overlay on top giving you the ability to support your customers make changes on your underlay to uh or move seamlessly traffic from one to another um and then traffic steering an ability to you know keep st to steer traffic so that it works best for your customers driving home that business value um so the two demonstrate two demonstrations that i'm going to show you today uh, and it I, I, i'm very sorry about running over on time but two demonstrations that we're going to show you today uh, very quickly application centric hybrid multi-cloud secure overlay and network follows the application dynamic this will only take a couple of minutes because it's so simple um application centric hybrid multi-cloud secure overlay uh you take uh acme core uh corporation they're trying to uh move some critical business applications into multiple uh, uh public cloud environments and on-prem it's extremely complex they're having some problems driving creating that connectivity there's poor collaboration between their devops teams and their cloud apps teams there's a lack of visibility and control this is what they're trying to get to they're trying to get to that point where they've got this web server that's running over in aws cloud they've got um, a, a microservice that, that's running in ibm cloud and they've got a number of uh services and applications that are running on-prem in openshift um so we look at the uh the workflow here so we're, we're going to introduce devon devon works in devops Claudia, Claudia works in cloud apps. Devin's going to use the CICD pipeline to integrate with the single SaaS uh, platform here. So he's just going to use his, his CICD to integrate with that call for connectivity as a service in the cloud. Um, Claudia is going to come along first. She's going to onboard that cloud environment. She's going to auto discover all of the infrastructure that's already been deployed. And then she's going to pass it over to, to, to Devon and say, I found your application systems. I found your, your, the gateways are in place. The infrastructure is there. You go ahead and create that security, create that connection for your application itself. And then they can both observe that and optimize over time. All it is taking but a matter of minutes. Uh, so here you'll see in this first one, Claudia is going to come into the login screen and log in. She's going to go to her cloud icon and register a new cloud. Uh, she's going to select the cloud that she wants to onboard, and she's going to fill in her cloud details and her secure and her keys. That then goes away and pulls back a full inventory of what exists in that cloud environment. So you'll see here, she's just gone and onboarded IBM Cloud. It's come back and said, She's got 21 environments in total. None of them are being managed by IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh right now. So it just pops up and says, you've got you know, uh, two locations, US East, US South. No, there's one environment in US East, 20 in US South. None are being managed. She's going to uh, click into uh, US South and say that she wants to manage that one. She's going to toggle the Manage button on, on US South. That then brings up and says that she's got an IKS cluster there. So she's going to toggle on manage for that and then manage that IKS cluster. She's going to turn on auto discovery and uh, input her uh, security, uh, her secrets key. And then she's going to say that she wants to deploy a gateway there to manage that environment. She gives that gateway a name. The gateway gets deployed automatically for her, uh, changes to operational. She sees the namespace gets discovered. She then wants to just say that she wants to auto discover the applications in that namespace. She clicks on that and turns on auto discovery of that um, namespace. And that, that means then now she can then go ahead and discover any applications that exist inside there. She discovers one called author. Now she's got, she's onboarded a cloud. She's discovered all of the locations where they have a, a infrastructure. She's 
she's turned on management of one of those IKS clusters in US East. She's then discovered that the application namespace inside in that cluster, and then also discovered the application that's inside there. And at this point, the infrastructure work is kind of complete. So one of the things that we like to think about is that uh, no team can ever be uh, successful if you're beholden on somebody else. We looked at that earlier when we saw um, DevOps and CloudOps working together or working in silos to start with, where they're constantly back and forth. And that DevOps team, is the application team, is never going to be successful while they're waiting on another team to give them the connectivity that they require to achieve their goals. So instead, with IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh, we are giving that DevOps team an ability, what we're calling you know, near self-service connectivity, where they can put the connectivity in place for that application system. They are the SMEs for that application. They put the application connectivity in place. So Devin's going to come along. He's going to select that application. He's going to select a secure policy for it. He's going to add a policy here to give that policy a name and say that he wants to use an encrypted path for it. And he's going to uh, select what needs to talk to it. So he's going to select a web service, web server talking to the author um, application. And he's going to create that policy. And now he's got, he's just created secure connectivity from that QOTD web to author. He can now look at this canvas view the topology view of the application system. This is showing him all of the application policies, the connections that exist between across this application system, this namespace for Q QOTD. He's got this here, and that's what's represented here. Now, that's the application view. When we said that they can both observe it, with, uh, when Claudia comes along, she can toggle this over to see the infrastructure view. This shows her the gateways. She can check those health of the gateways and the metrics associated with those gateways um, and the connections across those. This is her area in cloud apps. This is the thing that she's going to be most interested in. Her connectivity from AWS to IBM Cloud to, um, to on-prem. And there you have it in literally about a minute and a half We've got clouds onboarded, we got gateways deployed, we got connectivity that was put in place between AWS, we put in a web server in AWS and a, an author microservice that's running in IBM Cloud. We've got all of that put in place in about a minute and a half where, you know, let, let's just, you know, think to the, the, the simple part of this where, if you try to do this without IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh and how long it would take, how many windows would you have to have open? How many browser tabs would you have to have open? How many CLI windows would you have to have open to try and achieve the same? And how long would it take? And how many errors would you encounter along the way? So that is the first one. So th this is, a, I think this is a good screen to kind of show you before and after. All of the what we see as the workflow before going to the after and how simple we make things um, and how it's optimized. I, you know, we saw that we can register that cloud and discover the applications, securely connect those critical business applications, unifying that solution, unifying the teams and the processes uh, associated with that. This one is the network follows the application dynamics. I'll do it as quickly as I can. Uh, pain points here is um, Acme Core are migrating services to the public cloud environment. Policy translation from on-prem physical firewalls into security groups in the cloud. Very, very difficult to do. It's complex and they're, they work in different ways. Troubleshooting that complex connectivity, finding that, that, that that uh, um, window to do the work. So this is the target topology that we're aiming for here. We've got a web service that's running in AWS again. We've got a number of applications this time that's running just on-prem in an open shift environment. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, add IBM Cloud into the mix. We're gonna put a gateway there and then we're gonna 
move some of these applications from on-prem into that public cloud environment in IBM cloud. And we're gonna see two things happening here. Um, one, there's a DNS microservice that's running in that gateway that, that gets deployed here into IBM cloud. This DNS microservice does two things. One, auto discovers the application. So we're gonna toggle on auto discovery of applications. Once you see the namespace existing there, as soon as that application gets deployed into the IKF cluster, that gateway discovers it and then says, I know that application. I'm gonna put that the, it, its specific policies associated with it in place at that moment in time. So instantly auto connects it back to all of the connections it requires. The second thing that that DNS microservice is gonna do it's going to automatically load balance the traffic. So while these tra these uh, applications are moving from on-prem into the public cloud environment, for a moment in time, you're going to have multiples of them. And when you've got multiples of them, to make sure that you have no service impact, that DNS microservice that's going to run across that overlay, it's going to say, I know that name. I hear the policies for it, and it's just going to low balance 50-50 across any other deployments of the exact same application. So let's take a look at this workload here. So the cloud onboarding and auto discovery is going to happen. That's Claudia's area. She's going to just deploy a gateway, and that means that it's going to auto discover um, the, the, the environment. Then she's going to hand over to Devin and say, infrastructure is done, Devin. You're, you're the one that's going to create the connectivity here. So Devin's just going to use the CICD pipeline to take a snapshot of the application system itself. He's going to take that snapshot and he's going to deploy it into the IKS cluster in IBM Cloud. And it's going to auto secure connect at that point. The system just takes care of it. And then they, Devin's going to go ahead and complete the migration when he's finished his tests on that application that's moved to the cloud and then shut down the one that was existing in the OpenShift environment on-prem. And then they're both gonna observe this over time. And you can see here, you, you'll see how they managed to do this in a matter of minutes. In this particular demo, we are just going to look at the canvas view here because there is little or no changes that actually take place in IBM HyperCloud Mesh. This is just the system working. So all of the changes kind of happen in the background. So. Claudia is going to expand this out to, to drill down into the namespace and the applications that are working there. Um, so when we open this up, you see the OCP cluster that's running on-prem. So the Tampa DC, this is all private environment down here. US West, this is AWS over here. When we look at the infrastructure view now, we see the two gateways, one in, uh, that happened pretty quick. So there was one on-prem, one in AWS, uh, in the background, uh, Claudia just went and deployed a gateway, auto-deployed a gateway into US East. That discovered the IKS cluster that was already deployed there. So the infrastructure is now in place. She can now hand over to Devin and say, use your CICD pipeline to do your migration. If you look at this engraving uh, application that's running here, this one's going to move over. Um, Devin doesn't really care about the infrastructure. He's only interested in um, the he's only interested in the application view itself. So he drills down into this IKS cluster and discovers this namespace here, QOTD IKS namespace. So he discovers that and then uses his CI CD pipeline, takes a snapshot of engraving, and deploys it into that IKS cluster. It instantly turns up here on this canvas view. And you saw as soon as it turned up, this connection policy was put in place instantly, creating this second connection for it. And that means at now, this application, which is the exact same as down here, is now in the cloud. It's now, it has its uh, exact po secure policy in place. He can see that he can do all his testing now. He can then move over here and see that there was a, a second deployment of it. And at that point, at that moment in time, it was just load balancing from one to the other. So you have no service interruption. And that allows Devin to do all of his tests on this new application that's running in IBM Cloud, validate that it's working as he sees fit, and then he can shut down the one that's on-prem. And you can see there 
that entire migration took place in about one minute. How fast were you doing uh, application uh, moves and workload moves to the cloud previously? How many times have you had to back out because you couldn't make the security groups work? How many times have you had to open up security groups just to get it working so that you can uh, achieve that goal? So that's our second demo here where we discovered how we can streamline that migration process, can maintain that business continuity and minimize the service interruption, optimize the migration costs and avoid vendor lock-in for all of that. IBM Hybrid Cloud Mesh, a single solution, a single solution for application centric connectivity as a service, this overlay blanket that gets laid down across this extremely complex environment of multiple clouds, multiple networks. Um, we have a, a community page, so get out your phones, take a snapshot of this um, QR code, come and join the community. Um, thank you so much for listening to me today.